So um, I want to tell you today about this work on hierarchical community detection, which is joint work with a number of people. And it was a long project that evolved and picked up co-authors along the way. It um, started when um, Sharmadi Padacharya, um, who is now at Oregon State, came to visit me in Michigan. He was at the time a PhD student at Peter Beckel at Berkeley. Um, and then we picked up various other people who were um, either students or postdocs of either me or Peter at, in the past, and most of them are now in different places. And this paper is available in the archive and um, it will appear in JASA Theory and Methods. Um, I think it hasn't appeared yet, but will appear soon. So before, oops, there we go. Before I um, tell you about that specific work, let me give you a brief introduction to networks. I know some people here know a lot about it, but I don't want to presume. So I'll just do this um, relatively quickly. Um, when I say network data, and it varies for different people, but when I say network data, I mean data on relations between entities that is directly observed. This is in contrast to traditional multivariate data that we normally work with in statistics, which um, normally has to do with properties of individual entities, right? So that's a feature vector. It's about one, let's say, person. It's their age, gender, race, grade, whatever. Um, that's properties of an individual. Data on relations is, are they connected in some way? Are they friends? Are they classmates? Are they um, COVID contacts? Um, could be different relationships. Um, there is a lot of uh, work as a whole separate area on inferring relations from traditional features. That's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to assume these relations um, are observed and they are my data. And of course, you can observe both at the same time. You can observe the relationships and traditional features. Um, this will not be the focus um, of this talk, even though we have done work in that setting as well. And networks occur all over the place. Uh, people, of course, typically think of social networks, social media as the first example that comes to mind. Um, and, and they definitely occur there, but there's a lot of scientific applications in ecology where people study relationships between predators and prey as a network, in transportation, obviously trade, relationships between countries. I personally work uh, quite a lot in recent years on neuroimaging and brain connectomics and their um, communication between different parts of your brain um, is represented as a network. And, and various other places as well. So um, there are a lot, a lot of applications and therefore a lot of people from different areas working on that. Um, just briefly notation for this talk, I'm going to stick to simple binary undirected networks. So for two pair, uh, for two nodes, for a pair of nodes, we're gonna have an N by N adjacency matrix and the entry of that matrix will be a one if those two nodes, which are my units of observation are connected and zero otherwise. Uh, I'm going to assume this network is um, undirected. So the matrix is symmetric, looks like something um, you see there. And um, I'm going to ignore the question of self loops entirely. Um, some applications allow self loops. It depends on the type of relationships. Like you could send yourself an email, but you cannot be your own friend. Um, it only makes a small technical difference to account for them one way or the other. So I'm just going to ignore them and pretend that all the entries behave the same. Um, of course, as statisticians, if we're going to do any kind of um, analysis and understanding of network data, we have to think of them as a result of some random process. If we're going to think of a random process, we need a probabilistic model. And this is binary entry, so typically they're modeled as Bernoulli variables, but if you have weighted edges, you can also use other distributions. Most of the work in this area, not all, not all, but still the majority make the assumption of independent edges. Um, so each entry in that matrix is um, assumed to be independent from all the others, apart from symmetry, of course, in the symmetric matrix. It's not always realistic. Uh, it's maybe rarely realistic. Uh, but it does make the analysis much more tractable, as any of you who work in random matrix theory will know. And um, 
it does give us useful results from the practical perspective as well. So um, I'm going to stick to that assumption for the for this work. And if we think about a binary matrix, if we just have a bunch of independent Bernoulli's, then obviously all we need to know about them is the probability of one. So all the information that's relevant is contained in the expectation matrix of the adjacency matrix, which is just a matrix of probabilities. Now, if you just have one network and you look at this P, obviously you cannot estimate anything from a sample size of one for every entry. You need to have some way of pulling information across the entries, otherwise there's nothing you can do. So that means you need some structural assumptions on P. And in the literature, people have made a lot of different kinds of assumptions. Low rank is a popular one. Um, some type of smoothness, um, communities, which basically means it's block structured and, and many other. But something has to be assumed about structure and P because you wanna be able to pull information. Communities is what I'm going to talk about today is um, just like clusters in multivariate um, statistics, easy to intuitively get what people mean by that word, hard to define mathematically. Uh, what people say, and this is not a mathematical definition at this point, is community is a collection of nodes that have similar connectivity patterns. They behave similarly within the network which typically suggests that people have some type of block structure, maybe not exactly block, but something like that. Often, though not always, it means a community is a tightly knit group. So nodes within a community are more likely to connect to each other than they are to the rest of the network. Um, but that's not required. They just have to be similar. They don't have to be tightly knit, but that's one common example. And then there is the problem that um, was traditionally called community detection, though for statisticians, that's not quite the right name. Um, really, we should have called it community estimation, um, which is the task of assigning each node to a community. Typically, or at least in the simplest formulations, it's finding a partition, though, of course, in reality, communities can overlap and you can look at that as well. But the simplest formulation is just a complete partition of the network, each node goes to exactly one community and your job is to divide them. I want to show you a couple of canonical examples, not because I really want to talk about them, but because I want to point out some features that have really informed people's thinking about this problem. Uh, from the examples that have been kicking around the literature for a long time and that have kind of been driving the work for a long time. So this is probably the most canonical community detection example. It's been around since 1977, it was collected by hand um, you know, in the days before social media by a sociologist observing these people. And it represents a student organization, a karate club specifically at some university, which um, had a conflict and split into two. And that was recorded. And that's what you see there. The two colors represent the ground truth communities. And that's why it's such a popular data set because they actually know what the communities are based on this and that's rare. And there were two, the squares are the, one was the trainer and the other one was the manager or something like that. And they were kind of the leaders of the opposing factions and people followed them. So this is a community with a ground truth. So what I'd like to point out about this is, this is a small network with a small number of communities, just two. And it's a fairly well-connected network. And you look at it and it's pretty clear what happened. And that's the kind of mental picture people often have in mind. Here is another canonical example, which looks very similar. If you don't know what it is, you look at it, okay, it looks something like this. This is the dolphin network um, where they were also incredibly lucky to observe the ground truth. Um, this is from trackers um, that you know, marine biologists attach to dolphins and track their behavior. And what happened there is the the node marked in yellow was one special dolphin who at some point left the herd, just swam away. And the red and the green group stopped communicating completely after that, they just split. And uh, mysteriously, I think almost two years later, the yellow dolphin came back and they started communicating again. So we don't know what you know dolphin life events this describes, but we know this happened and they recorded this. So this is another instance of ground truth. And very similar structure, well-connected, small network to communities. 
This is another and the last canonical example, which is a little bit more modern. So you have more nodes. This is political blog data um, about US politics. Um, now that was back from the 2004 election where people started thinking US politics are becoming polarized. Kind of funny to think about that now. Uh, but somebody went through it and uh, labeled them manually as liberal or conservative. So this is ground truth marked by hand by um, some, some person from the School of Information who was actually here when they did that. Um, and the links represent web links to each other. So slightly bigger, slightly more complicated structure, but still just two communities and still fairly connected. So that kind of picture is, I think, what um, led to the huge popularity of this particular model, which is definitely the most ubiquitous now in the literature, the stochastic block model for communities, uh, which postulates that um, you generate labels for communities by rolling a die, basically, or sampling from a multinomial, you assign a label. So that's the color here. And then based on this label, you generate edges and the probability of an edge between two nodes depends only on their colors and nothing else. So in this picture, there's a total of six possible values that this probability of an edge could take. Um, and it is a low rank model. You can um, you know, easy enough um, to write out the expectation of the probability matrix. So P is the N by N matrix. This is um, an example with just two communities. Um, you can represent it as this low rank um, decomposition. Um, the two by two matrix of the probabilities themselves, the probabilities of connections. And these black and white things represent what they call the membership matrix, which just gives you a one um, if the node belongs to community one, or it gives you one zero or zero one. That's the way to encode the membership. And so here, all the first half of the nodes are in community one, the second half are in community two, and you can decompose the matrix this way and you see that it's rank two. So this is a low rank and block structure. And um, spectral approaches have been very popular to this. And it's nice to look at it sometimes in this very simple case of the stochastic block model because you can just calculate it by hand you know, any um, student can do this exercise, compute the eigenvectors of the matrix pictured here. And you will find that the first eigenvectors is not interesting. It's um, just proportional to a vector of all ones. And the second one exactly splits the communities. It gives you half positive entries, half negative entries, normalized. And so you can just read it off the eigenvectors. If you have more than two communities, you need more than two eigenvectors, but it works the same way. You can just read it off the first k eigenvectors if you have k communities. And that's why people do spectral clustering, um, which means you basically compute the first k eigenvectors, then you cluster the rows of that matrix. And that's been shown to recover communities well in many cases. So, but just to remind you why this is a not trivial exercise, it's not just about computing the eigenvectors, it's because obviously it's noisy. And if I show you this matrix, which is um, a realization of this one, right? So this is what it should look like if we had the expectation. Well, of course there is some noise, but this looks very clean. You can see exactly where the communities are, but you only see where the communities are because they're ordered already in the correct order. If I take the very same matrix and reorder the nodes randomly, it'll look like this. And so, you know, it's a little bit less clear and the eigenvectors will be noisy. And, and just for comparison, here is another matrix. And this last matrix is an erdos ramey graph. So that's um, a matrix with um, equal probability for every single edge just IAD Bernoulli edges, no structure, no communities, and well, it doesn't look that different. So it's not just the matter of just looking at it and seeing what the structure is. It's a little bit more than that. So what do we know about this? We know quite a lot and people have written many papers and there is an excellent review. Um, uh, I think it started out as a review paper, but then it became a review monograph by Emmanuel Abe. <laughs> 
Uh, it's very thorough and uh, very well written. So there are many models for communities, many algorithms that have been proposed. We have theoretical guarantees for um, a number of settings now, but still relatively simple ones. We know optimal rates for a subset of those settings. We also have ways to estimate the number of communities that obviously has to be done. You typically don't know what this K is. We have some ways of um, assessing goodness of fit of these models. Not great ways yet, but we have some and for doing model selection and testing. And then there are a lot of extensions to more complicated scenarios, more complicated than the simple cartoon example I showed you, which accounts for different distributions of degrees, um, for overlapping communities, for covariates on the nodes and the edges, additional information, evolution over time, different kinds of edges that's called multigraphs, multiple networks, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of work on it. So, um, out of all this, you can still distill a fairly simple general principle, which especially I think if you don't work on networks, this is a helpful, simple shortcut to remember. What do people really do there? Um, the general principle, basically two things. You can get communities if two things hold. One is this information of interest, which is the communities or whatever information you're looking for is contained um, in the expectation of your adjacency matrix. So in the example we showed, uh, we looked at it was the second eigenvector. It could be other things, but it has to be there in the expectation somewhere. And the second thing you need, obviously, is that you don't observe the expectation. You observe A itself, so you need concentration. You need the difference to be not too large, so then you can look at A and get something about E. And basically, these two things are the things you have to show if you're going to ever Establish guarantees for community detection. Um, spectral structure is not necessary for this claim, but it's a nice bonus because if you can show that you can somehow get this information you want out of the spectrum, you can do spectral algorithms, and that's usually fast and scalable. Whereas things like maximizing likelihoods, um, this is uh, at least naively put, it's an NP complete problem, right? Because it's a combinatorial optimization. So that's usually hard. So spectral structure is not necessary, but it's nice if you have it. And this ICM review paper that we wrote basically um, summarizes what we know about concentration, or at least what we knew in 2018, which I think is still mostly correct. So some improvements have been made. Um, and basically for network community detection, that's good news. Um, this is the result for an inhomogeneous or Rainey graph, which means probabilities can be anything. They don't have to follow a structure. Uh, but the edges are independent. So what we know for that model is as long as your expected node degree, which is the expected number of connections one node has on average, grows with the size of the network as at least log n, we call that dense networks, they concentrate, but good. Sparse networks do not concentrate. So if it grows slower than that, then you don't, that this concentration is broken. However, there are ways to fix it, and there are multiple ways to fix it, and some of them are really simple, like you add a small constant to every entry or something like that. And after that, after you regularize in that way, sparse networks also concentrate. So we can work with this. Um, there are many cases where we can establish concentration. So, okay, this is all good news. Model is simple. We have um, spectral property. So what makes it hard? What properties of this setup actually make it hard in practice? And the Karate Club example is not hard. Every algorithm works on it basically, but some things are hard. So sparse networks are hard, partly because of this concentration issue and partly just because, you know, the more edges you have, the more data you have, right? So you just don't have as much information. Unbalanced community sizes are always harder than balanced. If one community is very big um, and the other ones were very small, it's much harder than if they equal. And there are mathematical ways to see it, but it's also intuitive. And the two particular challenges that I hope to somewhat address with uh, what we're actually going to propose today are the um, next two um, highlighted in blue, which is large case 
large number of communities. Um, all these things break down very quickly as um, K grows. There is a reason that canonical examples have two. Um, maybe five is okay, maybe 10, you wonder. If you have something like 100, there is no hope, um, unless you have tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of nodes. It just doesn't scale that way with K. So that's a challenge. And then um, the other challenge, which is which comes up um, you know, anytime you try to do actual science and talk to scientists is what does it all mean, right? What is the interpretation? And um, quite often more than one solution makes sense. Like it's nice when somebody marked the ground truth, but when you're looking at real data, even if it's a social network, um, like one um, thing that I personally have looked a lot is school friendship data collected from surveys. It's like American high schools, um, kids reporting who their friends are. And you can definitely see communities there, uh, but they correspond to different things, right? Some cars, they, they, you could divide by race, you could divide by gender, you could divide by sports, you could divide by all sorts of things. And they're all communities and you don't really know um, what's the best way to interpret all this. So the question we're going to ask and hopefully answer in the um, affirmative is whether hierarchical community detection can help with this, especially with the last two problems. So the next thing I wanna do is make the case for hierarchical community detection. And I have several uh, arguments for it. Um, first of all, the real world is multi-scale. Um, even if you look at social media, this is, According to Facebook, this is all of Facebook. So you can see there are communities there um, that correspond to countries and so on. But of course you can zoom in um, and you'll still see communities. This is the Facebook network of one of my PhD students. Very thankful for him to, for this picture. Um, there is a Chrome extension you can install to, to get this out of your Facebook. And he ran his own community detection algorithm on it. Um, and, you know, of course there are communities among his friends and um, the colors actually even tell you like the, the maize and blue and Michigan colors. So those are his friends from U of M. He's from Mexico. So the colors of the Mexican flag are his Mexican friends and, and so on. They're, they, they're meaningful communities to him and they're clearly communities. So that could be recovered um, in a hierarchy in a way that you couldn't really be uh, in a flat partition. Interpretation is the second argument because any hierarchy gives more information. You just have to look at this tree, right? This little snippet of a tree of life. If I just gave you the partition, which would be the bottom layer of this tree, that doesn't give you nearly as much information as the whole tree itself. And so that helps with interpretation. And um, the third argument, more kind of statistical, is that you don't actually have to worry about the number of communities when you do hierarchical community detection or hierarchical clustering. This is like a classic textbook picture of hierarchical clustering. And you just build the whole tree and you can cut it where you want if you want a partition, but you don't have to worry about it as much. And you can also look at multiple partitions. So one of the things that people um, think about when they do regular hierarchical clustering, which is, you know, they've done for decades and decades in, with regular data is do you do it top down or do you do it bottom up? So top down, you divide and then divide further. Bottom up, you start with every observation in its own cluster and then you merge. Um, for multivariate data, for Euclidean data, both make sense and it depends on what you wanna do. For networks, it's, um, kind of clear that top down is preferable because at the bottom it's all ties, right? We have binary edges. So all we can really start with is neighbor or not neighbor. We can construct metrics after that, but top down seems to be easier um, for networks. So that's what we're gonna do. By the way, feel free to stop me with questions. I should have said that in the beginning. Um, at any time, I, I don't mind being interrupted at all. So uh, we're not going to invent uh, a new hierarchical clustering algorithm. There's no need for that. There's plenty of them around. We're just going to see if we can improve community detection with one. So we're going to use um, an old and very natural intuitive um, algorithm called recursive partitioning or recursive bipartitioning because we're just dividing in two. 
It's a very simple thing. Um, you start with a whole network. You need a stopping rule, which tells you split and not split. You check that rule. If it tells you split, you split into two, and then you recursively apply it to each subset, and you continue until the rule tells you there's nothing left to split. Um, people have looked at it in the past um, and compared and contrasted it with flat partitioning, so K-way partitioning all at once. It was once a popular thing to do for Euclidean dissimilarities, especially in computer science. So there are these papers from the late 90s, early 2000s that studied it. Um, empirically, there seems to be a mix of opinions. Um, she and Malik is a very well-known paper on normalized cuts that's coming from computer science. They say that empirically recursive is worse for weighted graphs. Um, Mark Newman's um, paper on modularity, also an exceptionally well-cited paper on networks. He is a physicist who works on networks. Um, says the opposite for networks, that recursive modularity is superior. And these are both based on examples, basically. So it's a little unclear um, what really happens. So if we're going to do this, there are a number of questions we want um, answers for. First of all, what's the best way to do it? Right? How are we actually going to proceed? And we need two things here. We need a good splitting algorithm. There are many choices. And we need a stopping rule. And the next thing, of course, we want to know is, does it work? Well, how do we evaluate? You know, What does it mean that it works? Um, and there are several things here we can look at. We can look at how well it estimates communities. Um, of course, but we also can look at the hierarchy, right? Does it estimate the whole tree if there is in fact a tree? Because that's part of the goal is to get this interpretation. So those are separate questions. Um, and finally, the question that I like to ask about every single thing that um, I ever do is why and when should we choose to do this over other things we could be doing? And there are many choices. In particular, how can we make that question more specific? Well, under what conditions is it preferable to K-way partitioning? If we accept we're going to partition, should we do it hierarchically or should we do it all at once? That's one specific question we'd like to answer. And then the other question we'd like to answer, which I think is quite important, is um, we know, you know from um, theory that there is, there is a regime there is a very sparse regime where you finally lose signal. There is a phase transition, in fact, uh, where you cannot recover community. Um, I told you that there are mostly good news, but it's not like it's not infinite. Like there is a phase transition. There is a point after which you, could, you just don't have enough signal, which makes sense. There's always such a point. So if you're in that regime and you have no hope of recovering the whole bottom partition at the bottom of your tree, could you still recover some of it? Could you still recover the top levels because then there's still useful information? And that is one thing we hope to be able to do with hierarchical um, community detection that is just not possible with K-way partitioning. So to answer any and all of these questions, we need some kind of model so we can do analysis. Right? So we need a network model that will allow us to consider these questions. Um, so I'll, talk, I'll come back to the model, but I'll just tell you um, about what we're going to use for splitting algorithms. We're, we're going to try and formulate um, the analysis relatively generally, just saying if we have an algorithm that works, so it's not for a specific algorithm. And there are a lot of algorithms that work. So in principle, you can use any community detection algorithm that you like that splits it into two. We tried two particular ones that have proven guarantees. One is basic sign splitting. Just look at the second eigenvector and the sign labels based on the sign. Um, that doesn't involve any regularization. So for sparse networks, that will suffer. And then we did regularized spectral clustering because that's a little bit more robust to sparsity. And they're both very, very fast. It takes no time to do this. And so that's easy thing to try. Um, uh, also Lisa, yeah. Sorry, before we go further, there's a question in the chat from Thomas Ball who asks, 
it sounds like there are many subjective analyst specific decisions being made. Is there a gold standard or set of typical heuristics to make this process more automated? And I think this question is with, with respect to the previous slide. Right. So no decisions have been made yet. <laughs> Uh, but yes, um, there are a lot of decisions that um, have to be made at some point and no, they are not automated and there is no gold standard. That would be an excellent thing to have. But um, I think the trade-off here is um, you know, having a fully machine learning type black box algorithm where we just give you this thing and it does it versus solving a particular problem in a particular application and understanding what's happening in that context. And a lot of networks are so diverse, they arise in so many places that I think with networks, you lose a lot if you're going to not at all look at the context and automate it completely. Though, of course, subjectivity is a problem and I am very aware of that. So somewhere there is a balance. Um, but yeah, I'll try, I'll try to highlight as I go through you know, what, what are um, the subjective decisions. And of course, there are many of them. So this is one example of a subjective decision, algorithm choice. Uh, but the theory that we'll do, will just say, if you have an algorithm with properties, then um, you can use it. So similar for stopping rule options, there are many methods um, that estimate K. You can use any method that estimates K or any method that just tests the hypothesis is K one or greater than one. And there are quite a few of both, we use um, something that's, I mean, mainly we do it because it's fast. It's also quite accurate. It's based on eigenvalues. You, there's this non-backtracking spectral method. You don't really need to worry about it. It just, you arrange a big matrix that's a function of the adjacency matrix and you compute its eigenvalues. And then that gives you a um, So the model, the model is the harder part. Um, and there have been some hierarchical community models that have been explored um, by the physicists mainly, and, and some by statisticians. Um, and what we are doing is related to some of the earlier work, but not quite the same. Um, so I'll, I, I won't go into the details of other models. I'll just explain ours. Um, and an important note is that for simplicity of notation and of presentation and also just calculations, we analyze a balance tree. The algorithm itself is much more general. It doesn't produce a balance tree, it doesn't require a balance tree, you could run it anything you want, but the model will be balanced. So, um, and so balanced means there is equal number of leaves at every um, level. And so it's like, this is a picture of a balanced tree with four layers. And um, we um, sort of code it up um, as a binary string. So um, if you look at the bottom eight communities, there are eight of them at the very end. And each one has a um, name that describes its path down the tree down there. And so um, if you look at them as basically distance between binary strings of these names. How distant they are as binary string, uh, strings tells you how long ago they split, right? The ones that split at the very end are just different in the last digit and the ones that split higher up are much more different. So we use that um, to measure the distance between communities. And then we further assume for simplicity and that can be relaxed, but here we assume that the probability of connection between any two communities depends only on their distance along the tree or their distance as binary um, strings. Um, let me just jump ahead for a second to show you the matrix. So this is what the probabilities look like. So it is still, it still looks like a stochastic block model. There's still eight blocks. It's just that the probabilities are constrained. So instead of having eight choose two different options, because it only depends on the distance of, on the tree and the tree is balanced, you only actually have four different values that the probability can take. So, so then we have these things we call mega communities. So each level up has mega communities in it. So 
the bottom layer is um, eight communities. Um, layer three is four mega communities. Layer two is two mega communities and so on. And you can define distance between mega communities the exact same way, um, just shorter binary strings. So um, to parameterize this, um, and again, we simplified it a little bit for initial analysis. Uh, initial analysis, this can be relaxed. We take equal community sizes. The paper actually relaxes that, but simpler. We have um, two to the L communities because everything is binary, which gives us L plus one levels, so layers. Um, and the probability of connection is just something that is, um, function of the distance. And it turns out that this thing also has an eigenstructure where you can just read off the communities and the mega communities very cleanly. Um, its first two eigenvectors are going to be just like the SBM. The number of its unique non-zero eigenvalues will be exactly the number of um, layers. And um, the eigenspace, I'll just show you the picture, will look like this. When you're at the top, the first eigenvector is all ones. Then you get one eigenvector that gives you two mega communities. So half ones, half minus ones. And then if you go to the next two, your next eigenspace has um, dimension two. So it's spanned by two eigenvectors. And one of them sits in first mega community and splits it further into two. And the other one sits in the other one and splits it further into two. So this is just a calculation you can do, or at least um, a really brave and smart PhD student can do by hand. <laughs> I, I wasn't brave enough to attempt it, but you know you could just sit down and calculate the eigenvectors. So spectral clustering should still work. Eigenvectors are still there. And so we prove a consistency um, theorem, which I don't want to go into too many details about this, but I want to give you the gist of it. Um, we do for this prof assume a hierarchy. So it's, it can actually be either assortative or disassortative. So communities could be either getting stronger as you go down the tree, which is more natural, or they can be getting weaker either way, but we need an ordering. Um, they all scale in the same way as the number of nodes grows. This is standard in all of the network um, literature. We, we use the sign splitting algorithm, but basically any algorithm with that level of consistency can be substituted. And similarly, any consistent stopping rule, um, so any rule that with high probability detects that there is more than one community um, can be used. And the non-backtracking spectral method that we actually did use does satisfy this um, consistency requirement. So what we showed, um, and I know it looks ugly, uh, but what I want to say about this is that there is um, a condition which involves, um, if you look at this n rho n, that's the degree, that's an important thing, how fast the degree grows, that's always there. It's always going to be in the denominator in some form in any community detection result. There is a k that's always going to be there if you account for k. It always gets worse as you have more communities. And there are like a few other things. Um, the important thing is that these conditions, which depend on these the functions of probability, get strictly weaker as you move up the tree. So um, it can be that you recover just the top two mega communities, but no further, or the top two layers of the tree, but no further. The conditions are strictly weaker. And so that gives you um, what we were really hoping to get, which is this partial recovery. We don't have to have the bottom correctly in order to recover the top. And this is a big advantage of a top-down method compared to a bottom-up method. So there is um, there is a paper doing bottom-up hierarchical community detection uh, from Kerry Freib's group. But then in order to have consistency, they have to have perfect recovery at the very bottom, because after that, it can only get worse as you merge. So if you're doing it bottom up, you can only have a correct result if everything is correct, whereas we don't have to have that. Um, top down. So Lisa, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Or if it's not, a, you know, if, if you, can, you can defer it for later, of course. So how, how do I, 
how does the, 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 the two following problems compare in which I, I think of just recovering the first, the biggest the two mega communities. And now I change the model so that it becomes a, a normal classical stochastic walk model in which the connection probability within the mega community is just the average of the connection probabilities, right? The average done the right way so that the density is the same. Which problem is easier? If I just want to recover the two mega communities on this model, or I want to recover the two communities on their average model that we sort of understand. Is there, is there any reason for it one to be strictly easier or harder than the other? That's a very good question. Um, so we, we did study exactly this, right? Because this is basically um, SBM with two communities under model misspecification, right? <laughs> So we treat it as an SBM with two communities, whereas the probabilities are not exactly the same. So, you know, for that reason, it should be harder because you don't, you're not using the true model. If you know it's a model with two communities and they have the same probability, if you're using a method based on that, um, then I think it should be harder, but it's a little bit difficult to compare because you need, you know, in order to compare, you need exactly to specify this misspecified model. Right. And it depends on how misspecified it is. See, I guess in particular, if you have only two levels and the second level is extremely easy, like the, the, inner, the inner probability is one and the other probability is zero or something like this, yeah, then the problem yeah, actually and, becomes a lot easier. Right? Yeah, and we actually run these simulations with, you know, like you can mess up with like how separate they are in different places and you can make it harder or easier. I see, I see, interesting. Okay, yeah. thanks. So, um, if you just briefly compare um, degree requirements, and because I don't want to show you that um, ugly fraction, um, again, I'll um, get rid of the probabilities. I'll just say the probabilities decrease in arithmetic progression, um, or increase rather, as you go down the tree. So it gets stronger. Um, because I just want to look at um, the dependence on the number of nodes and the number of communities. So what we need um, is the degree growing um, as basically log squared of n. So that's not bad. That's basically still log m, some penalty of two plus epsilon. And essentially linear in the number of communities. Now, um, there is a algorithm that can, it wasn't written for networks, but it can be used for networks. Um, by Das Gupta et al., um, which is much more complicated than ours because it does recursive partitioning, but it also does pruning and resampling and other things. It's much uh, more computationally intense. It does scale better in N, and they did this computation, so that's just log N, but much worse in K. It's K to the seventh, and so if you want to do large K, then that's not ideal. Um, then there is an algorithm of Balakrishnan also for Euclidean features, but you can sort of translate it to network and you can translate the rate to network. That is a bounded K, or at least the result they have is only for bounded K. I mean, maybe they, it could be extended. And the, scale, the degree scaling in N is almost linear. And then finally, the paper that I mentioned, the bottom-up, um, hierarchical clustering um, also has bounded K and scales as root N in the number of nodes. So on the balance of things, I think we got a pretty good deal, right? Log squared of N is not that much a price to pay. Um, to pay. Um, how much difference can this really make in practice? Um, well, depends on what you're doing. And I want to focus on I don't want to compare different ways of doing recursive partitioning and different algorithms. I just want to look at the simple comparison of k-way all at once versus hierarchical. That's, that's my main interest. So how well does it do for community detection, for the number of communities, and also for the whole tree? Uh, for the whole tree, we have um, that sort of gave us pause because how do we compare it to a method that doesn't estimate a tree? How do we get a tree from k-way partitioning if we want to compare? Well, and it's actually fairly simple. You just do the same thing we do. You run hierarchical community detection on the population probability matrix. You get the population tree, quote unquote, or whatever you have for it. And then you can do that on the output of any K-way um, method and construct a tree and just use that for comparison. Um, we need a tree similarity measure and we just use a completely standard one. 
which is um, basically um, the difference between the similarity matrices between nodes induced by the trees, between tree distances. And so you look at one similarity measure, one and the other similarity measure and just take the Frobenius one. Um, so I'll show you a couple of pictures. And like I said, our main um, focus is on what happens with K-way uh, versus recursive, and especially as K grows, because that was the main thing. Um, so we are showing two versions of hierarchical community detections that um, that's red and green. That's one is spectral clustering, one is sign splitting. And you can see that um, spectral clustering is slightly better sometimes, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, so for just estimating K, what's the alternative? It's just the non-backtracking method applied to the whole network. And you can see they all underestimate K and that's well known. As K gets larger, it gets worse very quickly, but ours lasts a little bit longer and then it gives a higher estimate. The same happens with community detection. We measure it by co-clustering accuracy on the nodes. Everything gets worse as um, K grows, but we have a little bit more room there. Um, same happens in estimating the probability matrix. Same happens in estimating the tree. This, these are all consistent. The interesting thing happens if you just look at the mega communities. So this is just how well you estimate communities at level one and level two, which I think to some extent Afram's answers your question. Um, well, not quite, but uh, to some extent. Um, so if you just do K-way partitioning, then run the tree back up. So you construct a tree from that and see what you get at the top of the tree, right, from that. Um, it's not the same. And the accuracy suffers um, for the K-way method as K grows because the bottom partition is not correct. Whereas we basically recover it correctly at the top level and slightly worse at the second level because it gets harder. Uh, but this is the partial recovery thing that we were really hoping to confirm um, that we don't lose in accuracy at the top levels, even if the whole thing cannot be done correctly. Um, just as a reminder, the algorithm is not balanced. It's just a theory. So you can run it on unbalanced examples. And this is just some made up unbalanced tree. You can run it in that and it's still going to do better. And all these things will be consistent. This is just one example. We're going to finish with um, a data example just for fun. Um, it's um, we actually in the paper there is a more serious genetic example, but this one is much easier to present um, and more entertaining. Um, this is a data set that was collected by Jason Jin and his students on statistics papers. They took about a decade worth of papers from four journals that they designated as top journals. They ignored the direction of citation and made an edge for um, people citing each other. So it's just, so the nodes are authors. And there are a lot of um, sort of like nodes that have very few connections because of every single paper. So when they consider the core of the largest connected component, which is about 700 people. So this is what the network looks like, uh, not the network, but the core. Um, so it's all connected and some degree, some nodes have higher degrees than others. Um, I used to put names next to the red nodes, but then like everybody stopped listening to me at that point and stared at the names. And so we took the names off, um, but you know, you can, you can make your guesses about them. Um, this is what the mega, I'll, I'll tell you in a second how we identified communities. This is the two communities that split off first um, as we ran the algorithm. And then this is the whole tree that we recovered. It stopped at this point. Um, I think this gives me 17 or something. Um, I'll tell you in a second how we constructed the names, um, but the number of nodes in each community is given in brackets after the name. So they vary in size. This is not balanced at all. And the picture is not balanced at all. Um, but if you look at the names, it makes a lot of sense, right? We see high dimensional statistics sitting next to each other at the very bottom. Some of the things that split up early in the tree are things like design of experiments. That's a pretty separate area, Bayesian statistics. And if you go through the tree and a lot of it is, is interpretable. And, and just as a reminder, this is um, 
a whole lot more information that you could possibly get from the list of these areas. If I just listed the communities and just gave you those names without the tree, um, that'd be way less um, interpretation that you could attach to it. So the way we constructed see, the I, names, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I wanted to ask you a quick question. Do you see instances of where, I mean, I know I can't think of an example in statistics from the top of my head, but I'm sure there's instances in which one area uses very much the results from the other, right? Like maybe statistics uses results from probability, say. Right, or high dimensional statistics will use yeah. results from the matrix theory, but maybe not as much the other way around. Do you, do you so see this? Unfortunately, unfortunately, the way they constructed this was they removed direction. So it's because they were just looking at the relationship between authors rather than papers. You can go back to the papers and I think there, but you really have to look at the directed network, um, I think, to, to understand that. Uh. Maybe you could look by seeing triangles or something, but yeah, right. Probably you need the yeah. direction, I see. Okay. Yeah, you need All the right. direction for that. Okay. Uh, so so the, the names are constructed in a semi-automated way and with some manual assistance. So what uh, my student did is he um, did a, you know, a web crawl and, um, you know, partly curated, but basically a web crawl and collected research interests for every person appearing in the network, which come mainly from their personal web pages, department web pages, Google Scholar, Wikipedia, places like this. It's not a perfect match to this data set because he did it in 2017, whereas the database of papers is from 2003 to 2012 and, you know, some shift, but it gives you some idea. And so um, then he looked at um, all the nodes that were put in a community and and their research interest keywords. It was kind of co converted to keywords and took the top three keywords from that group. Um, and then from that, we manually constructed a name. But you can sort of see, like, say, for the first group, the three keywords that came up were Bayesian modeling and inference. So we called it Bayesian statistics. Um, you know, something that was called um, inference and multiple testing. We called it multiple testing and inference. Um, but most of it came from web crawling. Um, so that's, and, and this, this is available um, on his web page. So if anybody wants these research interests, uh, um, like that's available for download. So uh, I know I'm almost out of time. So let me wrap up. Um, the take home message on hierarchical community detection is that it's a very simple thing to do. It's fast and it's quite accurate. Um, it gives you interpretation and just additional information in the form of the tree. Um, and it can do partial recovery, which um, we established either, either under this binary tree SBM model, which of course is restrictive, but you know, there's always a gap between theory and practice. In practice, it's quite broadly applicable. And the biggest gains it has are for large K for when you have a lot of communities. Um, which makes sense given the multi-scale nature of a lot of these data sets. Um, there are many ways in which you can take this work forward. Um, one thing that I'd like to do at some point is bring node covariates into maybe estimation, but especially understanding of this multi-scale structure and understand what is driving splits where on the tree. Um, also possibly edge covariates and multigraphs, um, especially in bioinformatics and in neuroimaging, there are often edges of different kinds. That's what a multigraph is. There's this type of edge and from this type of imaging modality and a different type of edge from a different modality and how do you do this together? Um, communities evolving over time always happens in practice. Um, not many data sets really track that well. There are a lot of open problems in this area still, and I'll stop here. Thank you.